Warning, this episode contains explicit content and strong language. Listener discretion is advised. Tales from the Trunk, reading the stories that did make it. I'm Hilary B. Bisnex. Listeners, I'm extremely excited to expand our oeuvre here on the show today by welcoming Cassie Alexander. Cassie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Hi, Hilary. This is great. Yeah, it's... uh, I like to say it's always fun to have uh, new friends on the show, and it's always fun to have local friends on the show. I know, even though we're not recording in the same room right now. Uh, someday. <laughs> someday. Someday I will have a better uh, in-person recording setup, and then I'm going to do so many live podcasts. It'll be amazing. No video, though. I promise. That, <laughs> that is my goal. I just rolled out of bed. I am not dressed. <laughs> Um, so Cassie, you're going to be reading from Am I the Asshole, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. If if people wanted to search for it, the title is actually the acronym AITA question mark, and it's <laughs> like totally lifted from the Reddit forum, Am I the Asshole, absolutely. Fantastic. And is there anything we need to know about this wonderful book before we get going? Yeah, so um, if you're not familiar with the Am I the Asshole forum on Reddit, basically it's where people bring their problems for judgment. It's usually somebody who's on the edge and their family or their friends are giving them shit about something and they're like, hmm, am I possibly in the wrong here? And so they post their situation on Reddit and then people chime in. um, Depending, and a a strong subgenre of these is always... Some person who opens up their relationship, usually a dude, but not always, and is like super surprised that all of a sudden their partner is getting all this play. They want to close their relationship again. Their partner is like, no, I feel sexually attractive. I don't want to close the relationship. And so anyways, um, so if you're familiar with the Am I the Asshole forum, this format will 100% make sense too. And if not, just pretend you're in your early 20s and you've made bad decisions before. So... (laughs) Fantastic. Well, ready when you are. All right. So um, I do have these Am I the Asshole posts kind of framing the entire book. So the first one is our protagonist, Becky, and she's an early 20s girl. So here we go. Dear Schmedit, because I didn't want to get sued. (laughs) This past weekend, my fiancé, 24M, and I, 23F, we were at a party at a friend's, and I'll admit we both got pretty wasted. Apparently, sometime that night he asked me if it was okay to summon a demon for a threesome before our wedding, and according to him, I told him yes. I don't actually remember this happening so clearly, but his friends must have heard me, because a week later they'd all pitched in to have a delectably demonic TM summoning kit delivered to our house for him. I want to put my foot down, but that would make him sad. I think he was really looking forward to it after I told him it'd be okay. And his friends really did spend a lot of money on this thing. It's top of the line, and they can't return it. You know how demons are. So, I kind of feel like a jerk. I mean, I did say yes, and I don't want to let him down. If I tell him no, am I the asshole? All right. Logan, because unfortunately Logan is one of those names for jerk guys. Sorry, Logan's (laughs) out of the world. Logan, does it have to sit on our coffee table? The delectably demonic summoning kit looked like a cross between one of those canisters they had for larger fireworks around the 4th of July and a ridiculously large caliber rifle bullet. The top unscrewed and everything you needed to perform a quality summoning was inside. The salt, the spells, and the measuring tape, so you could create the lines you needed quite precisely. Cheaper summoning kits, where you knew you were only going to summon up a succubus for long enough to get a handy, according to the research porn I'd looked at, were made of cardboard and had little succubi holding pitchforks printed along the sides, winking saucily with their hips cocked out. 
this one was comparatively tasteful. It was made of burnished forest green colored metal, and if you didn't know better, you could pretend it was a work of art, which was something I would know. I worked <laughs> at an art gallery. I counted out ten heartbeats waiting for him to respond. It was a habit I'd recently picked up to try and calm my nerves now that I wasn't drinking, to try and get more conscious of my own presence in my body. I mean, really, Logan, I went on. He looked up at me in our kitchen from where he'd been portioning out tomorrow's coffee into the machine. What? he asked like he hadn't heard me. Does it have to sit here? I repeated. He pretended to consider things. Oh, you'd rather me put it on the bookcase? Or maybe the mantle beneath the TV? You know what I mean, I told him. I do, but I also know what you said. Y-E-S, he spelled out before giving me a grin. I sighed. This is bullshit, and you know it. He laughed, finishing setting the coffee maker's dials. I'm not a jerk, Becky. I'm never going to make you do anything you don't want to. I just think our relationship's strong enough to handle this is all, don't you? <laughs> I looked between the summoning kit and him. We were getting married in two weeks. I'd better be sure of him. Y-E-S, I spelled back. But right now, when I'm hip deep in wedding planning... That's why my mom got you a wedding planner, he said, ever so reasonably. Mm -hmm. uh, no, your mom got herself a wedding planner, I muttered. Oh. It'd been pretty clear that marrying into the Graf family, my opinions on my actual wedding were extraneous. I just hadn't cared because, well, his mom cared so much, and my parents weren't alive anymore anyhow. Well, if it's a timing thing, then all the more reason we should do it sooner than later. Then poof, it's gone, out of the way and off the table. He put his hands on the back of one of our dining room chairs and lounged over it sexily. Logan Graff was, for all intents and purposes, a hunk. From his chiseled face with his inquisitive eyes, his leanly muscled arms, and his washboard abs, I knew when I'd first spotted him on the campus quad that he would be a catch. Then he'd walked over, and somehow I had caught him. <laughs> and now his great-grandmother's diamond ring was on my finger, and there was a demon summoning kit in my living room, and it felt a little bit like all the walls were closing in. I just, I began, my voice drifting, entirely unsure how to explain how I felt to him. I loved him. I loved our life. I loved our apartment. I loved our dog. Okay, we didn't actually have a dog yet, but we had the kind of lives where we could have a dog, and it felt like that should count for something. We were perfect on paper. Logan was the tab A to my slot B, and I knew, quite viscerally, that I didn't want to be alone in the world. After my parents died, shit had sucked. He was good to me, and I liked that. So it would be stupid of me to walk away, especially when I didn't have anything else to walk toward. Tonight's clearly not the night, he said, cutting me off with his usual congeniality, and then he raked his eyes over me with a look. Bedtime, he suggested with intent. Y-E-S, I spelled in relief. Anything to get away from that thing and to pretend that everything was good. Thirty minutes later, our teeth were brushed and Logan was over me and pounding between my legs. We'd skip most of the foreplay. I just wanted to get to this part because it was usually my favorite. Staring up at him, feeling him in me, knowing that for this little piece of time the two of us were one. Becky, he grunted my name, making a tense face. I knew he wanted to come and that I was nowhere near an orgasm's vicinity. It's okay, baby, I told him, running a hand up behind his neck. Go, go, go. I told him, and so he did, taking me at his word, finishing himself off inside of me with a few short thrusts and groans. He collapsed over me, covering me, pressing all the air out of me like he was holding me still, and I just wanted him to keep me there. I nestled my face into his neck and wrapped my arms around him. You want me to get your toy? He asked, lifting his head up. No, I'm good, I said, stroking a lock of dark hair out of his eyes. There's just so much going on, and I've been so much in my head lately, and only your mom would schedule a new artist reception in our wedding in the same month. He snorted and leaned forward, slipping out of me as he kissed my forehead. She's like that. You'll get used to her, he said, before rolling to one side to hold me close. I snuggled up against him and let things feel safe and good and right. It's not about the kit, is it? he asked, disrupting my happy bubble. I blinked. Uh, no, of course not. Was it, though? I mean, knowing it was in our apartment certainly wasn't helping. And had he been plunging into me just now, pretending I was some succubus? <laughs> Good, he said, stroking his thumb up and down my arm. Because I'll go throw it away right now if you want, Bex. I closed my eyes and gritted my teeth. I wanted to tell him, yes, please, because as long as that stupid demon summoning kit was in our life, it was like putting a child in a room with a chocolate bar. <laughs> Something was bound to happen. You couldn't even blame the kid. But at the same time, throwing the chocolate bar away just because the kid couldn't be trusted with it seemed like a waste of perfectly good candy. 
I'd bounced around between relatives growing up, and so I'd lived in tons of different places. My poverty-enforced Midwestern roots said we shouldn't waste money, even other people's, and the vestiges of a brief Southern upbringing felt that reselling it would be rude. But everyone knows demons don't count, Bex, Logan went on, placing a run of soft kisses against my hairline. Was that true? There was really only one way to find out. I guess, I agreed with him, not knowing what else to do. <sighs> really? He asked me quickly. I took a shuddering inhale and then exhaled with a nod. Yeah. If I made him happy enough, surely I'd be happy too. That was how relationships worked, right? Tomorrow? He pressed. Yeah, I said, bravely <laughs> trying to convince myself. And he was right about that earlier, at least. Once it was over with, it'd be one less thing on my plate. He squeezed me tight. Becky, you are the best girlfriend ever, he said. Fiancé, I corrected him, <laughs> and he laughed before swatting my ass. Go take a shower if you're going to. I've got to be up in six. I did as I was told, and he was asleep before I came back. <laughs> All right, let me just read you just a little bit from the summoning itself. Okay. Because I just want to... I want you guys to meet Quenelith. Oh, my <clears throat> goodness. All right. <clears throat> so, unfortunately... Well, not, you know, not unfortunately, because things turn out okay. This is a rom-com, actually. <laughs> so, uh, Becky uh, goes ahead and, um, you know, goes through with things. And so she and Logan are naked in their living room. He's helpfully moved all their furniture aside and put the salt spell on the floor. They've repeated some gibberish, and... Um, here comes uh, the demon, all right? <laughs> I don't know what I'd been expecting. I just never could have imagined summoning her. The being in front of us wasn't like a happy little ditzy bouncy succubus like they showed in the commercials for the sex shops. First off, she was definitely a woman. Yes, she had curves, and yes, they were bracketed by the finest fetish gear that I had ever seen, a series of bust and hip-clinging straps that barely hid anything, but despite her near nudity, her entire presence screamed self-possessed, and she hadn't even fully turned around yet. <laughs> but when she did, my heart leapt into my throat. Her hair was so dark green it was almost black, and a wave of it swept over her high cheekbones, old Hollywood glamour style. She had full forest green lips, chocolate brown eyes, and all of her very visible skin was a shaded spring green. She was stunning, so put together and so pretty that I had to look away. <laughs> I'd been creeping behind Logan out of nervousness as the cloud appeared, but now I was glad of his larger bulk to hide me. Welcome, succubus, Logan said, his <laughs> eyes flicking back and forth to the spell brochure's page, still clearly following its instructions. My name is Quenelith the Conqueror, and I am no mere succubus, she said, staring at him imperiously, one perfect eyebrow cocked. And then she spotted me and lightly frowned. And you are? she asked. Logan Graff, Logan said, giving her his full name like we were at the DMV. <laughs> I didn't say anything, I just swallowed. And Quenelith ignored him. And you? she asked me. I liked to think that I was not modest, despite all evidence to the contrary, and that I was not a prude, same, same, but at that moment I had never felt more naked in my life. Becky, I squeaked out, my voice breaking. Ah, the demon said, tilting her head slightly. I couldn't help but notice how elegant her neck was, her hands too, and I had no doubt that when she walked her hips would rock back and forth like a runway model's. <laughs> Quinlith eyed me like she could read my mind, and I full body flushed, desperately hoping that that was not the case. Well, humans, she said, before you get any ideas, let me give you my rules. First off, you touch me, you die, she said, pointing at Logan. I felt him tense. <laughs> what? He sputtered. You clearly heard me, she said, unwilling to repeat herself. But I summoned you, he protested. Yes, you did, she said, walking to the edge of the nearest design element to tap the line of salt at its edge with the pointy toe of her high-heeled boot. And just how good a job do you think you did if I'm the creature that you got? <laughs> she stroked her chin in mock thought. It's not my fault that some of the packages are defective. Feel free to scoop all the salt back up into the bag and return it to the vendor. Logan was utterly confused and on the path to getting angry. You're supposed to be... What? The demon asked him, then glanced at me. Like her, she said, waiting a beat before continuing. Soft, small, pliable, please... I blinked, instantly wanting to defend myself. I was none of those things. No, I was all of them. <laughs> if you want to get a boot kit out and polish my boots for me, that would be acceptable, Quenelith went on. Jacking off in front of me is also allowed. 
I may or may not, however, make comments about the quality of your anatomy. She solely ground a toe of her boot into the salt in front of her while speaking, and I knew it was scratching the hardwood. Or, she thoughtfully began, giving me a sly look before returning her attention to Logan, you can give me your girl to pleasure. <laughs> I gasped aloud. It felt like I had been struck by lightning. She wanted me? No. It was impossible. She was her, and I had cheese breath. <laughs> Logan went stock still in front of me. So what is it, human? She challenged him. Do you want me to eat your girlfriend out or not? I am literally standing here, I hissed, safely behind <laughs> Logan's shoulder. Yes, and that's a shame. I would much rather you over here, she said, pointing to the ground beside her feet meaningfully. Spread eagled. I audibly gulped, and Logan put a protective armor out around me. But was it really, though? If he'd been truly protective, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> Possessive, more like. And at this stage in the evening, after setting up all this, did he have a right to be? <sighs> Look, this is not what was on the package, Logan said, flipping around the spell and holding it up to show her the agreeably smiling creature on the front of it. No, Quinelith agreed, crossing her arms so that they framed her breast perfectly. I am better in all possible regards. She smirked when she looked at him, but I would have sworn I saw her eyes soften a bit when she looked at me, and I couldn't help but keep cocking back. I'd been around beautiful women before. I thought my friends were lovely. I'd been in plenty of assorted locker rooms, and of course I watched TV. But I had never, ever met or even dreamed of meeting someone like her. Because in addition to being gorgeous, Quenelis seemed completely self-assured in a way that I had never felt. I didn't know if I wanted to be her or be with her. I just wanted some excuse to stay at her side. She took a step forward, and now she was definitely looking at me. Only me. I wasn't making it up, and I was pinned. <laughs> but before I could manage to figure anything out, though, she disappeared, and with her, the spell that she'd cast over me. I blinked, stumbling forward into Logan's back. Logan? What just happened? I whispered. I felt his leg waggling beside me and looked down. He'd broken the summoning circle with his foot. He'd sent her home without even asking me. He looked down with a frown. Let's just never talk about this again, okay? Okay, I said, slowly nodding. <laughs> Oh, I love her. I love all of this. <laughs> it was a super fun book to write. I loved it. <laughs> I I remember you talking about writing this and just being like, this sounds amazing. And <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so with all of this awesome stuff, and I think I know the answer or one of the answers to my second question but it wouldn't be tales from the trunk without letting us know is there anything that you ended up having to leave out that you really loved you know i i wrestled with this because you warned me this is a question that might come up hillary but i i'm gonna be a, an asshole and say <laughs> no because i wrote this book and like nine days in like <laughs> just like some sort of wild inspiration fever um because i was so enamored with the characters and what 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 was going on in the book so um i i didn't have to edit it that much because from the second i got the idea and actually it was a friend of mine her name is kelsey who was like oh my gosh you know they should do a demon summoning thing where the <laughs> demon goes home with the girl and i'm like oh my gosh i'm writing that but only as an am i the asshole thing but that was since that lightning bolt happened it just kind of poured out and so no i didn't really leave anything on the cutting room floor that's fair that is a fair answer yeah it's i mean you know i i don't have those moments too often myself, and I don't think most writers generally do. This but... is the first magic time for me. I was very pleased. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. if if you get to have that fugue state where you just <laughs> produce the rom com demon porn of your dreams, <laughs> like yeah, then you should just go with it for sure. <laughs> you just gotta do it. <laughs> um. Oh, that's so so utterly delightful. Though. Oh, thank you. And. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I think there's often a lot of professional jealousy in being a writer and being friends with other writers uh, that, like, people will talk about, you know, oh, like, you know, they sold such and such a thing or whatever, but, like, 
my experience a lot of the time, like, yeah, sometimes I'm like, oh, man. Uh, but most of the time when my writer friends have something good like this happen, I'm, like, my reaction is just like, you know, yeah, I love that for them. <laughs> Very much, very much. I love, I don't know if you're a Schitt's Creek fan, but that's one of the things that Alexis, one of the characters in it, says a lot, like, I love that journey for you. <laughs> and she, and it sounds sarcastic because she's a little bit valley, but she actually it means it. And, and I feel like that's a really useful phrase. Like, that's mm-hmm. great. Keep doing your thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think I know one of the answers to this, but do you have... A favorite part that you got to leave in that when you realize like oh you know in this fugue state oh I'm gonna get to write this oh well that's what kept me going was I knew so much of the book beforehand that I just always had a different scene to be writing for and for you know and I just I was so excited to have these characters fall in love but also to get to explore like the change in Becky because like she's on a timeline right she's like two mm-hmm. weeks before she gets married and all of a sudden her world has been upended by this experience with a woman and now she has to choose like who she's gonna be and to some degree for the rest of her life because she lives with Logan and she works for his mom so I always had things to be aiming for for the romance beats and then Mm -hmm. also like you know the kiss and then like an escalation and stuff um and then you know they do finally have very fun wing and tail sex I just want everybody listening to know (laughs) um but (laughs) but this is a very it winds up being very hot I just yes the please read it for the heat um but but yeah then exploring how she felt along the way um was uh something that I really wanted to get out there too because I I feel like uh you know to be honest I probably am not as as well read in the sapphic genre as I should be and uh, yeah it's not it's not a probably I definitely am not I'm, I'm not well read at all. It's one of those horrible writer secrets where you don't read a lot once you start writing a bunch because you only have finite free time. Yep. But um, but I just really wanted to get into Becky's point of view as she kind of went through her journey between thinking, oh, I just kind of like this girl versus, oh my gosh, I need to change my life because of this woman. So, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, we love to see a good queer awakening. Yeah, yeah. And especially a good queer monster fucker re- awakening. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> um, that is, again, absolutely delightful. Uh, I think that listeners, if you're into queer romance and monster fucking, this is definitely a book that you want to pick up right away. Uh, and honestly, a lot of Cassie's other books as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm all about the monsters. <laughs> And I'm all about the bisexual pro tags, so <laughs> yep. it's just usually when I start writing about them, they already know they're bisexual. There's no awakening part. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, fair. Absolutely <laughs> fair. So uh, before we get going, a uh, couple of questions. One, do you have anything that is coming up from you that you're also excited about telling our listeners about? Yeah, um, I'm sorry, Do you when do you think this is going to be um, live, Hillary? This will be going live on December the 3rd? <clears throat> oh, okay, great. That's perfect timing then. Because um, I'm re-releasing, I don't know if you want to put this in or not, but I'll tell you and you can decide. I'm re-releasing a lot of my backlist right now, and actually um, a book that I will have released on December 1st is titled... Um, Her Ex-Boyfriend's Werewolf Lover. And yes, I know the title is somewhat cheesy. You can blame Amazon, SEO, and algorithms for that. But that book is, um, it also has a happily ever after, but it's about a woman and a man who were both in love with the same man at different times. And Mm -hmm. his death propels their relationship. So, yeah, so they, it's... um, it explores kind of, uh, it's like told in the present tense about them getting together, but it's also told in the past tense about their experiences with Vincent, who's this man that died. He's uh, he's in the mafia, basically. He fell in love with one of his bodyguards. His bodyguard was a werewolf, but then they couldn't be together anymore for reasons. And mm-hmm. so um, he uh, broke up with his bodyguard, and then he fell in love with Samantha, who was this... Um, 
prostitute because he knew that he could trust her and she wouldn't have any secrets from him like being a werewolf. And so, uh, but after he's murdered, um, basically she has a locket from him that has a phone number inside of it. And he told her to only open the locket if he's dead. So she does. And it has a phone number on it. And the phone number is for Max, this werewolf. And because he basically knows that if he got murdered, then the only person who could protect her is the werewolf that he used to love. So, um, so it hits kind of like the love beyond the grave kind of tropes. And it also has a lot of BDSM. And um, yeah, so that book I'm re-releasing on December 1st. And I'm super excited that people get to see that in the world again. Fantastic. Then, thank you. And then, and then more than that, in January, I am uh, re-releasing my Dark Ink Tattoo series as well, the first one of which is Blood of the Pack. Mm-hmm. And it is about um, a woman named Angela who runs a 24-7 tattoo studio in Vegas. And she is... Um, she had a kid with a werewolf. She accidentally became a werewolf. And she, uh, the <laughs> as werewolf, you do. as you do, you know, accidentally. But, um, the werewolf, the werewolves in Vegas there are, um, a, a bad motorcycle gang, basically. And, um, her kid is seven. She thought that she was out, but they want her back in because they want her kid, even though her ex is still in jail for murder. And then one of her um, tattoo artists works the night shift, and his name is Jack, and he is a very bisexual vampire who can feed (laughs) on blood or sex. And so, uh, and he has very strong feelings towards her, so he wants to save her. So, um, yeah, that is, that's my other fun series that comes up that has a lot of, um, it's like Sons of Anarchy, only if everyone was uh, queer and the whole thing is X-rated. So, yeah. (laughs) Fantastic. Well, listeners, if any of that sounds like your jam, I (laughs) encourage you to go and seek it out Uh, again. uh, Blood of the Pack will be coming out in January, and uh, I already forgot the name of the other book. I know, no, no, it's fine, it's fine, it's complicated. Her ex-boyfriend's werewolf lover is coming out in December 1st, so they're all all up for pre-orders right now if you look up Cassie Alexander, and they're all wide, they're on all platforms. I didn't want to put all my eggs in Amazon's basket. Excellent, yeah. I was going to say her ex-boyfriend's werewolf lover sounds very much like a Chuck Tingle title, which I just, (laughs) like... I love those. Uh, no, yeah. You know, unfortunately, Amazon doesn't reward subtlety, and it is yeah. the biggest dog in the game. So even though that book is wide, I still have to kind of pitch it as, like, something that will be understandable to Amazon readers, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. so Yeah, that makes sense. Amazon is the bad river website, and we hate it, but yeah. we rely on it. Yeah. Uh, Finally, before we get going, well, I guess not finally, finally, but (laughs) before we get going, is there anything that you've been uh, reading, watching, listening to that uh, you've been really excited about and you want our listeners to know about? Gosh. So, (laughs) I just finished a really cute book by a friend. You know, it's funny you mentioned monster fucking earlier because I've just started to claim that title and it's just going to be who I am from here on out. And one of my friends released a monster fucking book recently called Quiver and Quill. And it is um, interesting because it's told in second person. Uh-huh. It's, it's very well written, though, and the second person is immersive enough that it, it, it totally works. And it's basically about this college-age girl going to a college campus where there's um, all sorts of different creatures, and she falls for her mythology professor, who is a mothman. Oh, <laughs> and I it's love fun. That. It's fun, and it's sexy, and and it deserves a shout out. So yeah, fantastic. Oh, and her uh, name is A.M. Core. Sorry. <laughs> not a the problem. Book, the book is Quiver and Quill, though. Uh, so, listeners, if you are into The Mothmen, <laughs> then check that book out as well. Uh, Cassie, thank you so much for coming on the show. Where can our listeners find you? Yeah, so um, I'm on CassieAlexander.com, and then basically if you plug my name into Google or into any of your um, search engines on, like, Kobo or Nook, you'll bring up uh, all the books that I've got out. So, yeah, I'm pretty out there. I I don't hide. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And do uh, And can (laughs) listeners find you anywhere on social media? 
Oh, gosh. Yes, <laughs> I'm on Twitter as Kathy Y4 there. Like, um, I'm very angry <laughs> on Twitter a lot. I don't know if you want to follow me. Well, I assume if you're listening to this podcast that you're cool, so you can handle me on Twitter. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, um, and then uh, not so much on Facebook and only occasionally on Instagram, although I'm really getting into doing TikTok videos. It's so strange, but I find <laughs> creating them very calming. Not not videos with my face in them. I don't like that, but, like, out of quotes and images from my books. It's like scrapbooking mm-hmm. only in, like, a live form. And so, yeah, I, I think I'm author Cassie Alexander on TikTok, so. Fantastic. Well, listeners, as always, links will be in the show notes so you can find Cassie wherever you want to, (laughs) (laughs) as long as she's there. (laughs) Uh, Cassie, thanks again so, so much for being on the show. It's been an absolute delight. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Hillary. This is really fun. Thanks. (laughs) Of course. Tales from the Trunk is mixed and produced in beautiful Oakland, California. Our theme music is is Paper Wings by Ryan Boyd. You can support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash trunkcast. All patrons of the show now get a sticker and logo button, along with show outtakes and other content that can't be found anywhere else. You can find the show on Twitter at trunkcast, and I tweet at hbbisniacs. If you like the show, consider taking a moment to rate and review us on your preferred podcast platform. And remember, don't self-reject.